Thank you for being here. It's great to talk about the 3D herbarium and the 3D exhibits for learning. My name is Sorel Oberlander. I'm the library dean at Cal Poly Humboldt. And this exceptional program over here will introduce himself. I'm AJ Bielum. And um, we're happy to share the 3D herbarium project and we hope we'll have enough time to talk about questions. Now first, if you're wondering what an herbarium is, it's a bunch of plants that have been dried, smashed, and lose their color and shape, and then they're stuck in specimen sheets that are filed away in drawers, and the digitizing of them is really simply a photograph, like you see three here of the Salal plant. Now, what we're gonna show you today is a little bit of an introduction, a demo of the 3D herbarium. The 3D herbarium is a web version of three-dimensional plants that connects to herbaria information and it allows AR and VR versions, which make it a lot of interactive fun. But I'm going to tell the story of how it started. Basically, this is a dissection table that's in our library and students look at it and it's pretty cool and sometimes I present it and after two hours of presenting it during IdeaFest, I wondered, is there such a tool for plants? To my surprise, there isn't. So we decided to create one. And how I did it is I work with Dr. Bogle, Shereen Bogle in the computer science program, and I proposed a challenge to the computer science students in their capstone class. I said, can you build us an interactive digital herbarium that could be a kiosk, and here are some of the uh, ideas or the resources, and can you make it an immersive botany experience? It's incredibly important that we make learning super engaging. And so in 10 weeks, Team Flora built a prototype. AJ was one of the members of Team Flora, and they presented the prototype and we were all very pleased with it and so much so that I hired AJ and we hired other students to develop the idea further. From prototype to version one took 12 months. So essentially we released on January 25th, the version one of the 3D herbarium. This curricular co-curricular strategy is something I wanna make sure that libraries hear about because you can actually do a lot with students in the most amazing ways. Now, what's next is we wanna build a three-dimensional exhibit for any discipline. Now, do I bring it back to class and say, would you build this feature or combination of curricular, co-curricular? Do we work together on all the features that we want it to be? That is something that we're gonna talk about, but first to share a little bit about the 3D herbarium, we wanna have the students talk about it by playing this short video. I actually don't. I actually do not have a passion for plants, but I definitely have a passion for challenges uh, from a software perspective. So a 3D digital herbarium is similar to a typical digital herbarium, except that instead of featuring large databases of just the flattened out specimens, we actually include 3D models as well. This is another cool one. And I think the common name is like Cobra Lily. We had to reach out and get botany assistance to be able to make this project work because you know, I simply don't have the expertise in botany. Uh, you know, my computer science assistant doesn't have the expertise in botany. Um, AJ mentioned to me that I would probably be dipping my toes into the photogrammetry and modeling, but here I am doing all of it. You'll notice also the background is blue. We used to use black background, but we started looking into color theory and like, okay, what can the software treat as a background and actually like treat as a plant? So there's quite a bit of software development. We use um, several APIs to make the program as a whole work, which allows us to control our 3D model viewer, which allows us to do our annotations and everything else like that. Uh, my role with this project is uh, collecting specimens um, to be shot, and I also annotate those models. Heather provides these annotations, which will show up on the site, just kind of uh, explaining the habit and phenology. It's been really great to be able to work on this project. Um, it's opened me up to the world of computer science. 
it's been really great to get like a glimpse and learn those skills and be able to add that to my toolkit as a scientist. You know, it really has to be a multidisciplinary process and you know, we, we like it that way. It's, it's been really cool to, to make this team mesh and meld together with our different expertises. Well, thank you, AJ Online, too. Um, <laughs> thank you all for listening to that because really we wanted to show you that when botany students and computer science students work together on a project, they're actually talking about very different disciplines and they get to know each other. And that's one of the things I like about this project. Now, I think I get to turn it over to my colleague, AJ. Thank you, Cyril. <clears throat> um, So welcome to the 3D Digital Herbarium. Um, as Cyril mentioned, typical herbaria, digital herbaria, they're just large databases of the images from real physical herbaria. So before we even really get started with the 3D Digital Herbarium, I'll sort of further give some motivation behind the reasoning. So this is CCH2, which is the California Consortium, or Consortium of California Herbaria which is um, a typical digital herbarium uh, uh, with a lot, I think it's almost all California species um, of flora. And so, so this is pretty much it kind of right off the bat. You just see, you see the first couple of rows of, uh, of images from herbaria and you see that there's a little, little click there to display the initial 100 images, right? So there are far more than 100 images. Um, and this is pretty much what you get very small images, you can click on each one and make them larger, but they're just, you know, they're small thumbnails of just endless images. And so then you can see the specimens are dried, they're flattened out, and there's really, even though they, they get amazing, you know, um, amazing hardware to actually store these specimens to try to keep the air out and the bugs out and everything else like that, this is your end result. So, we thought it would be a little bit better to come up with the 3D digital herbarium. And similar to the CCH2, you can find the vast majority of our specimens uh, on the collections page. So here when you click collections, you can scroll through, you can see all of our available 3D models. And one of our favorites, one of the earliest ones that we did actually, is the uh, Solal plant, uh, species named Galtheria shallon. So after you select a 3D model, you, uh, it loads up and then you, you're immediately presented with the first annotation of the model, which includes the classification, the profile, and um, information about the 3D model, how it was created, with how many images, et cetera. Um, and so this is, this is your basic layout for, for when you select a model. Generally, we'll have anywhere from six to eight annotations on average per specimen. And the annotations, uh, really are what make this a, a great learning tool. Um, they sort of guide you through the plant with its you know, basic information. We tried to make it a very general approach, sort of approach general audiences with it. So to go through it, they can, um, they can generally either be text and a photo, explanatory text um, you know, to say what's going on with this particular, with this particular photo. Uh, and then they're also always cited. Um, you know, for who took the photo, which this was actually one of our assistants who took this one, and um, cited, uh, the modeler is cited as well on that first annotation. Um, so here we have, we have the taxonomy and the description, which is always gonna be your first annotation. Then here our second one is stem morphology. We have habitat and range, and they're not always the same for each specimen. We kind of go through and kind of pick and choose what we feel is sort of most important to highlight about each individual specimen. But these are, you know, pretty general ones that we'll have on most, most specimens. So here you have the fruit. Um, you got the flower here. Also another image um, created by one of our assistants, I believe, yes, by Hank. And then in addition to uh, photos with the expl explanatory text, we also have video annotations. So that makes it even more immersive, more of a fun learning tool to try to keep, you know, young, young people specifically engaged with the tool. Um, 
And then finally on this one, we have one, one final annotation about the leaves. So that's pretty, you know, pretty typical. And then in addition to the 3D models, which you, of course is the, you know, the real base for the 3D herbarium, it is still a traditional herbarium in a sense because we also bring in images from our local campus herbarium when they're available. So that's generally, generally for local specimens from our area. So uh, we can just click on the images tab there. And it'll take us right to the image section. So these are images from the Cal Poly Humboldt Vascular Plant Herbarium. Um, and when we don't have images from our local, local herbarium available, we actually bring in images from uh, GBIF, which is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. That's also where we actually bring in a lot of our, uh, our data, our taxonomic data. And that, that API actually really helps to provide a real backbone for our website, um, right down to when you, when you search for any plant. So in addition to that, we also um, provide an occurrence map. So this just gives you a rough distribution in the world of where the specific specimen that you're looking up exists. So the Salal plant, we can see it's commonly reported, and this is from GBIF, it's commonly reported, we can see sort of along the west coast just of uh, North America there, and then also uh, in Europe. And um, we have different layers that we can apply to this map, so we can do uh, GBIF, Global Biodiversity, information facility, uh, or we can do iNaturalist, or we can do both, we can superimpose them. And so, um, and I'll get to what iNaturalist is, if you guys don't know what, what iNaturalist is, I certainly didn't before the start of this project. And so you can see again that the distribution's roughly the same. Um, we didn't really want to stop there, we really want this to be an immersive tool. Um, and so, Back to iNaturalist, so if you guys are unfamiliar, iNaturalist is, a, is the social media site for, for biodiversity enthusiasts. I believe we're getting close to about 200 million total observations. Uh, what, I think they have over, over 7 million active users now. So it's in, you know, if you're, if you're into biodiversity, like I said, it's pretty much the site. Um, I, as I mentioned in the video, I'm not even super into plants, but like they're definitely slowly growing on me through all of these. <laughs> all these different uh, cool technologies, you know. So when we go to our iNaturalist page, the first thing that we're greeted with, first of all, is that the internet's probably not super great in this room. <laughs> uh, but you'll, typically you'll have your images loaded up and you can see uh, what user uploaded that specific image. You'll have the title, you'll see where um, that particular image was uploaded from. And then you'll also have uh, the date that the image was uploaded. So we can immediately see here, you know, a few users. This is a slideshow, so you can just go ahead and scroll. Check out, you know, just what various users have been uploading of whatever 3D model that you were just looking at or whatever you search for in the search bar. Um, beyond that, we have, again, the density map. This is auto-populated from iNaturalist. You can also use GBIF again. And uh, we'll go right back to this because the map on this page actually does some really cool stuff with respect to the social media site side of, uh, of iNaturalist. And so we also give you leaderboards here, which is another thing that iNaturalist has. So you can actually see the most active users who are observing or identifying whatever flora specimen that you happen to be interested in. So we thought that was really cool, so we definitely added that. I think an important note to share is that the botany class that does plant identification they encourage students to go out and as an assignment and identify them through iNaturalist. And that's part of the way they use um, iNaturalist as a classroom activity too. Absolutely right. And I don't want to get ahead of myself, but um, we definitely have more plans for iNaturalist, which we'll, we'll talk about it for the future portion of the project. But the other cool thing that you can do here is you can actually narrow down your results uh, through, through the filters that we have. So like, for example, let's say that, you know, I'm at Cal Poly Humboldt, and um, so of course I live in Humboldt County, uh, and I want to see just in my little area, maybe in a 50 mile radius, I want to see fresh, uh, fresh observations, you know, just from this year. So we can go to enable the location pin, maybe drop that down to about 50 miles, like I said. Uh, we could do a start date of, January 1st, and then uh, before today. And then let's say I'm just a regular user. I don't really care if it's verifiable research. We'll just say any grade. 
and we'll just leave it blank. Just, you, just I'm a regular user, I don't even wanna worry about that. Well now, after I've applied those settings, I can zoom back in, I can go over to my area, and I can drop a pin. And then once I've dropped that pin here on Little Eureka, California, it'll take me right up back to the top to my observation results. And now I can see observations from Arcata, McKinleyville, Arcata Community Forest, which our, our university is right there in Arcata, California. So now I'm seeing you know, results from users that are right in my area, observations that are right from my area. I can see you know, very, very local flora. I can now see my pin on the map so I know where I am. And it even updates the leaderboard so now I can find the most active users on iNaturalist that are looking for specimens that I'm interested in and you know, I can really target them and message them on iNaturalist, which again, not to get ahead of myself, but that's actually coming for the 3D herbarium as well to where you'll be able to upload your observations and message your friends on iNaturalist through the 3D herbarium. So really, really cool, really, really engaging. And like I said, we have a lot of plans for this to make it just even more engaging. We really want people to have fun while learning about plants. And then finally, we even have an API where if you're out for a nature walk or what have you and you stumble upon a specimen, you're not quite sure what it is, you can actually take a picture of it and then upload it to the website and the website will ID it for you. So for example, we will choose our latest download, which is an Acer macrophyllum leaf, but we won't tell them that. <laughs> so let's see if they can guess it. So we double click that. There's our uploaded image, and then it's first guess. It's not super sure, but see, we, we just gave it a leaf, and Acer macrophyllum's a whole tree. So it just looked at the leaf and it's like, I'm about 43% sure that you know, this is from this tree. So, and then, you know, say you're out, you, you gather that, you upload it through your plant ID, then boom, you, well, first you can come and learn a little bit about it, a little bit from Wikipedia, et cetera. Then you can click on it, and if it's available, it'll take you right back to the collections page where you can see the associated 3D model. And, yeah, now I've confirmed definitely that the internet's not great over here. These, are, and this is actually something not to get too far into it because it's not for, it's a topic for a different day, but we are really uh, debating with ourselves how large to make these models, how detailed to make these models because it's a trade-off. The more detailed and the more, the larger the model is, the more, you know, detail and, um, and the further down you can zoom into the model, the longer it's going to take to load into your browser. It's really kind of no way around it. Um, so yeah, we won't let this one load up because like I said, Connection's a little funny over here. I tried this, I, I tested this just downstairs where it's a little bit better and it worked just fine, so. Um, that's, that's about the, the long and short of the website tour. One thing I also did want to mention is we're really big on um, citing for this website. We really want to give the students specifically a lot of credit for the work that they do. So it's pretty much everywhere in the site, but like especially for the 3D models, you can easily filter these by who actually made the model. These are all, well, that's me of course. And then these are our other two student, two student assistants who've uh, created models for the site. And then the annotations, we've had a total of three botany students and, um, who've worked uh, on annotations for the website. And so you can immediately filter for all their work just so that they can easily display it as well. Um, it's about the long and short of the website tour, so I will give it back to Cyril. Well, there, there is so much to this that we'd like to show you that it does get to be very interesting to play with 3D objects. Um, we have a mobile uh, large screen, touch screen um, that the folks can play with and the, the form. What um, is also available here, down at the bottom, it shows you an AR VR button. So if you touch AR, it's gonna make it an AR image. So it's really fun to show people on the phone. But VR, you have to have goggles, so we're a little bit uh, I'm gonna share that these things are intended to be engaging and immersive, and like AJ was saying, we wanna make it sure that the students are cited as a new form of scholarship. These are important elements to how do we create opportunities for students' assignments to communicate science to the community at large. 
because oftentimes we write for ourselves and then we're surprised when people aren't following along the same way we are about science. So how do we create more opportunities to connect people with the science of this? Did you want to show the tree that you made? Yes, we're, we're at the future, certainly. Okay, well, oh. I think AJ's got to share this slide and then I'll do the next one. So, oh, well, should I just okay. click off? Yep. Okay, all right. it, there's actually a button on the bottom. Well, when we go to the homepage, so I was really excited about this. Um, as Cyril mentioned, this project was born out of the um, anatomage table that we have on campus. Um, and that has a slider on it, one of, one of the many features that it has, it is almost too many features, is you can slide and it'll slowly um, peel away layers of the human body revealing the inner anatomy. Um, and it, it's really, really detailed. It goes, um, you know, I mean, from the skin, like to the muscle, to the tendons, et cetera, et cetera. And so we really, we really like that about it. And so on the homepage for the 3D Digital Herbarium, we do have a slider here that shows um, a couple of the magnified layers that one of our botany assistants had images of, of a pine tree. So as we use this slider here, it takes you from the, pine, uh, from the outer layer, the bark and leaf layer, down to the 100x phloem, um, 100x magnified. And then if you continue to slide, it'll take you down to the xylem, which is the, the last inner layer that we have in 40x magnification. So we think that's really, really cool, experimental feature for right now, but if we can get more images, um, we definitely look to, to do more things similar to this. Yeah, the other day I told him that we're gonna add gaming features in there and he <laughs> didn't throw me out the window, but it was close, I tell you, it was close. So um, we are really looking forward to the future because we submitted an IMLS planning grant to transition this project away from just a 3D herbarium towards 3D exhibits for any discipline that's configurable by the institution or on our shared uh, hosted uh, site that we're developing. So we wanna be able to provide you customizable configurations and APIs and editorial submission workflow um, we're thinking to integrate that with Omeka because a lot of us use Omeka. Can I get a share of hands, a show of hands of who's using Omeka? Awesome. Then we want interactive features like flashcards and games because quite honestly, we've got to make learning exciting and fun. We know what's happening to book reading and our book stacks but we have to think about what are the new forms of books and how are they engaging. So this is our attempt to make an inspiring environment for botany and other disciplines. We're gonna partner with some folks to give us feedback on our prototype and our mock-ups. And we're gonna, we've already started a lot of the documentation of photogrammetry. It's been interesting to see the difference between using your phone on video mode, on photo mode versus a digital camera. All of those matter because you can create photogrammetry 3D models with your phone and they're really nice. And discussing 3D options, uh, sorry, preservation options. So the future is actually kind of bright and we're here also to share, we love your feedback and suggestions because it is quite fun to play with this, 3dherbarium.org. But one of the questions that's keeping me excited about this is what is your vision for the future of learning in digital environments. And maybe asking it this way, what are the learner's behaviors and expectations for learning? And how are these two aligned in our research? Because I would argue that this question is one of the most important questions to ask in how we are teaching learning and understanding and applying science in the community. So AJ and I welcome Really appreciate your feedback and your presence today. And um, I'd like to give a round of applause to AJ for being a phenomenal project manager programmer. <laughs> Phew, we gave you five minutes for questions. Anybody want to ask a question? 
Thank you so much. This is super rad, and I can't wait to see where it goes. Um, I hate to have to ask this, but how did you meet your campus's accessibility mandates? That is an excellent question. You know how hard it is to procure Sketchfab and other digital services? Um, we have been navigating that quite a lot, and our goal is that we're gonna make this as usable as possible. So a good example is the annotations themselves are the alt tags for the actual 3D models. So the, the irony is that the annotations are serving that need. However, there's other things that we have to contemplate, how web accessible it is, we've gotta make sure that it complies with the standards, and at the same time, realize that it now creates new possibilities of printing things and making them available where they're not. Important point here is most herbariums, if you've tried to knock at the door, they're not open. They do not open for you usually, but this is more accessible than the, the reality. So how do we make this more accessible? We're all interested. Our um, ARC Academic uh, Accessibility Resource Center has been working with us initially and will work with us on the ongoing times to figure out how do we navigate this. Suggestions are welcome. Other questions, comments? I'm Andrew. Gonna, I'm gonna give you the curveball. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> so um, at our school, any of the AR, 3D, VR things, we struggle with changes in the technology and changes in the standards and changes in API. Yeah. So pardon the pun, but how do you keep this an evergreen project? <laughs> evergreen project. <laughs> I think this is gonna be one of those things that you're gonna see constantly changing for a while. So a good example is uh, the 3D models themselves are going to be available as one file type. All of the photos are actually available in TIFF in our Digital Commons site. Um, so it allows us down the road to shift gears again. And um, we're gonna assume that this environment isn't finished changing, but um, if you have any, um, I'll, I'll say um, suggestions for the best file type. Anybody uh, remember, uh, what, how long did it take TIFFs to become the archival format? And it's still being argued. <laughs> I don't know if I answered your question, but I loved your question. <laughs> Other questions, comments? How about a question to you all? If you were to create a 3D exhibit where students could actually annotate and learn about this, whatever it is, what would you like to create? Because it's actually easier than we thought. We chose plants, the thinnest thing in the world to do in 3D modeling. And the reason is, is if you can do that, everything else is super easy. And we could even do it with our phones. The Salal plant, the main 3D model actually that you saw was actually done on my iPhone 7. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm from Purdue and we have an Amelia Earhart. Uh, we're the ones that gave her the plane that supposedly has been found now, but so maybe we can do some 3D modeling of what that plane looked like. We also have a lot of astronauts, so maybe we can do some spaceship stuff. That would be kind of cool too, probably. <laughs> I love it. Well, our vertebrate museum loved the 3D herbarium so much that at a, the celebration party when we released it as open source, um, they wanted to get trained on photogrammetry and started doing some skeletons and skulls. And so the flying squirrel looks really cool. <laughs> the mycology club actually wanted to do it and they were trained and they went out in the field in October rainy time to go ahead and videotape a mushroom and uh, actually make a 3D model. So this stuff is gonna get easier and easier to do, but what do we wanna showcase and why? And those are really good questions for us to ask because more and more, it's not just the 3D printing that's happening, it's actually a learning environment that people explore and are, and are immersed in. And that's what we're cultivating, that's what we're curating. 
and it's exciting. So please um, welcome suggestions anytime. There's propaganda back there about our library. We are so eager to hear um, your thoughts about what 3D exhibits you'd like to build. And thank you all for being here.